Hey, welcome in everybody to the next edition of Sports Fanatic News as we're going to talk a bit about how Charlie O'Connor tweeted an hour ago that it seems like the Flyers are in the final stages of hiring John Tortorella definitely will bring more stability, compete, and something the Flyers never have had in years, neutral zone play. So that'll be nice to see. Um, and then when it comes to the Phillies, they finally beat the Flo- or Miami Mars. I don't know why I keep wanting to always call that team the Florida Marlins. But I always make the joke when I do that, too. They weren't good enough, so then they had to just be called the Miami Marlins because they couldn't represent all of Florida. But, um, Mark, first and foremost, how are you doing today before we get into it? I'm fantastic. I, I feel great, man. How are you doing? Doing good, doing good. It was nice to get out finally after the rain depleted. I got to take my dog for a walk. and everything. <laughs> So it was nice to get to do that. I thought today was going to be one of those washout days that you're just sitting inside doing a bunch of stuff but it turned out to get a little bit brighter outside so yeah no that that nice uh yeah that nice cecily tynan lady told me it was going to clear up so i'm glad it finally has yeah exactly tomorrow might be hot but you know at least we're uh, getting a clear up so i'll take it but yeah like father's day is supposed to be like 80 degrees so that's nice i'm supposed to go golfing with my dad on sunday so that'd be great um yeah it looks like we're gonna have a nice little weekend here Oh, nice. Yeah, I like golfing, too. My dad got back into it because he's retiring. So all of a sudden, all the stuff he used to do as hobbies when he was 20, <laughs> he's like, cool, I'm going to start doing that again. So like, he's got back into like all that stuff. So he's back clubbing, going yeah. out and stuff yeah, like going that. Out, probably he'll start windsurfing again, like, like he's all a, the stuff he used to do back in the day. Yeah. He's an old city a lot, just getting crunk. Yeah. <laughs> well, he used to go. He always would tell me about when – um the flyers would go to the bars after he would be one of those guys that would oh. go to some of those bars and then Clarky would be right next to you. Schultz, he would be right next to you. Yeah. Roxy's was it? Yeah, what was it I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was Roxy's. Yeah. That sounds really familiar. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah it was yeah. something like that, but it was like down the street. You just walk down there and you would just get hammered with the player for like two or three hours. And <laughs> it, was like, it was like, it was like, uh, like that, like if that now in the minors, you do sometimes have that feel a bit more because it's a little bit more loosey goosey. Oh, sure. Or right across the street also from Reading. So that's yeah. where they have a lot of the post, but in the NHL, you never have that anymore. Like that's very rare. If you have an NHL player that's coming out the board, there's a select few, but it's rare if you have an NHL player coming out the bars that are good at part. Like Jeff Carter, for example, was one of the select few. Jeff Carter was <laughs> Mike Richard. Mike yeah. Richards was one of the yeah. select few. But like you guys are twins, yeah. Yeah, there there was a select few. That's why I loved Richie. The one time I got to meet him at the 93 3 um, MMR thing in the Metroplex, they got pissed at me and him because I talk too much and he talks too much. So they're like, yo, if you want to talk, take this dude damn social media because we have to move this damn line along. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so like he got and then same happened with Carter at the uh, picture thing at the carnival. They got pissed at us because we kept talking about the Stanley Cup and how they weren't able to get off <laughs> with him. The guy was like, this is a picture. We're not supposed to be having a full blow conversation. Right now. Oh, that's great. Wow. He Mike Richards wanting to talk. That is not how I would know him. <laughs> no, I think it was in that setting. Like if you're sure, in a setting sure. of like signing, yeah. you're not you're not around the actual media like that. You're you're gonna get quoted on anything. You're basically just free and loose. And that's kind of that's why I like the podcast where I feel like when you have guys on podcasts, it's not like in the interview room. They're very more open about how they hockey career developed or if it's baseball, how their baseball career I didn't interview anybody in baseball, but hockey, it's like how their career developed. They'll be more open about it where if they're around media members they don't trust or know. They're sure. not going to be as open. So I do appreciate that about uh, the podcast side too. And I think that's what helps, but going off of that, I think uh, first and foremost, we should probably get into the Phillies and the fact that they had two walk-off wins, not just one. And one is by uh, the, one of the guys that looks like he's seemingly becoming one of the best backup catchers all of a sudden in baseball in uh, Garrett Stubbs uh, on top of him and Bilotti, uh, Do you think this team is going to be able to kind of, be discontinuously sod for now until we add what we need around the bullpen and other assets or do you think they're not they're going to, the depth is eventually going to catch up to them because it does have that feel a little bit but well 11 of 13 is pretty damn good so yeah. i don't think they're going to win you know for every next 13 games they play every group i don't think they're going to win 11 but i do think they're finally at the point where you don't really think of them playing down to their opponent. And if they were going to do that, they were going to do that against the Miami Marlins. They could do that obviously in these next five games against the Washington nationals. But I think that they have gotten past that point. I think Joe Girardi was not the right fit here in Philadelphia. I by no means think Joe Girardi was a terrible manager. I don't think he was some guy that was way too hard on the players. 
I just think whatever he instilled in this locker room, in this clubhouse here in baseball, I don't think that whatever that was mixed well with this Philadelphia Phillies roster. I think a lot of these guys are veteran players now that want to establish, if they haven't already established their own way of doing things. And I think Joe Girardi had another way of doing things that just did not mesh well with this grouping of players. So moving on from him, the way I describe it best is it gave this team back to the players. It wasn't about Joe Girardi's clout over this team or really his persona over this team with this team. It really went down to uh, Bryce Harper running the clubhouse. Bryce Harper being a veteran leader on this team now and taking ownership and having every other player have accountability and talking to former players. I had the opportunity to talk to Tommy Green a couple of days ago. Uh, he was on my show and Tommy Green had talked about how when you move on for a manager, that cliche does actually take effect of guys taking more responsibility for themselves because they know now guys are losing their jobs. So you not performing, you not doing your job, you not pitching well, you not hitting, you not fielding well, playing heads up in the field. That's going to cost people jobs. And that does grab players' attention. I think it's a mix of both of those reasons. One with the clubhouse going back to the players and the other with players taking more accountability, realizing that guys will start losing their job. I think all of that has made them play at the level that they're at. Now, I do think that there's talent, just flat out talent in that, in that clubhouse. The guy that I'm waiting to see a little bit more from in particular is Nick Castellanos. We'll see if that's eventually coming out there. But in the meantime, you're seeing guys, like you mentioned with uh, Bilotti, for instance, you're seeing guys like, Garrett Stubbs yesterday, you're seeing guys like Matt Veerling, you're seeing guys like Bryson Stott step up and show you how deep this team can be. When and you I've go to a game, Veerling. yeah, yeah, I and always you, like Veerling, it's just from yeah. the minor leagues. I love going to Reading and Lehigh, and from following him, he was always, if he could just figure out how to hit freaking righties, he'd be fine. <laughs> that was always the thing. It was literally, oh, he was basically the mini worth where I don't think he's ever going to be to that degree, but like. Right. It's Same kinda, approach. Yeah, Rob Thompson just told him, okay, good, we're going to give you playing time, kind of like Chuck did years ago. Screw it. You're the guy. We're giving you playing time. You're going to get through the qualms of facing righties through thick and thin because you're the best fielding option we have also, which is kind of the case yeah. right now because Odubel, I do not trust fielding in center field when you have Schwarber and Castellanos in the corner. So yeah, I feel like neither, neither do I. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think most people I agree with you on that one. But I, just to, to wrap that up, I was just going to say that uh, – the three guys that you had step up to help you win the win of these games uh, in recent, you know, during their 11 and 13 or excuse me, 11 for 13 uh, the run here. When you go to the ballpark or turn the TV on, you never know who's going to step up and be the hero. And that to me is what makes a really good baseball team. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And Stubbs, I mean, when he came in, when you would look at all the kind of was just great defense, great call in the games so that we got all that from him. And then now everything that you saw in double A and triple A of him actually hitting, now it wasn't 313, it was more like 265, but like hitting well in the minors is starting to come to fruition in the majors. So I think he also, I noticed in the interview, he gave credit to not just the main hitting coach, Long, but both hitting coaches and said both of these guys in unison are kind of helping me with different things. So I right. feel like that just shows how well this staff's working this year compared to some past years with the Phillies too. But the biggest thing you brought it up, I noticed with Rob is he seems to kind of have that Joe Madden effect of like, I'm going to tell you what I want you guys to do, but in terms of how you do it, I could care less <laughs> as long as you do what I tell you to do. Uh -huh. That's what matters to me because like you said, the, the locker room and the team that you see the smiles on the bench before I know you would talk about it. Ricky would talk about it on the post game all the time. You just see that on the bench all the time, the blank face. And you never want to see that on any team's bench. So mm -hmm. I feel like the moving in the right direction. I think Rob was also a guy that should have been a manager years ago because he was kind of in the makings to be a manager right. for a while in baseball. So it's kind of, I wasn't surprised he got the job over dusty because when my one good buddy on uh, PlayStation would I was talking about this, because he knows a hell of a lot about sports too. I tell him he should do more podcasts, but he's more shy than I am. Uh, but <laughs> um, the, he, uh, and he watches this, so know who that is. Uh, but um, <laughs> stop being so damn shy. Get off PlayStation. Start a podcast. What the hell's the matter with you? <laughs> yeah, there you go. You got it from two people now. But um, no, I think they Rob Thompson really has just helped to brighten up and open up this locker room because when you have the Yankees offer you, well, almost offer you the job that after the Girardi, they go to somebody else. Obviously, Boone. That that's the team of history. Now, I don't like the Yankees, but that is the team of the history of the league that's the kind of mecca if you can somewhat emulate them you're golden 
So like that style, I do believe in. I don't believe like I don't like the whole fact of the whole Yankee aura and how cocky the fans can get and all that extra blah 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 blah. But the whole culture, everything. It's like I don't like the Bruins in hockey, but if you can emulate their culture a little bit, you're going to be good because the Bruins are one of the most well-respected cultures of the game. So it's kind of like along those same lines is kind of how I would look at it. So I think Girardi coming in kind of brought the wrong side of the Yankee culture to the clubhouse, where it seems like. Thompson's bringing the right side of the Yankee culture to the clubhouse. And that's kind of what I think is working. And if I, I, I hope he continues to do well, because I think he deserved to be a manager a while ago. And I hope this is the team he can kind of right the ship and get everything going in the right direction. Cause it would be nice to see. He also, he also is easy and all the post game interviews are so much easier now where I don't feel like <laughs> I want to rip my hair out trying to listen to our manager micro explain a mistake he made. Yeah, well, well, I'll say this. What I do appreciate um, is there's, there is honesty there. And one thing we always ask in every press conference, and we watch press conferences in this city, man. We, we, we love them, man. We just eat them yeah, up. Yeah, everyone is obsessed. Yeah, with yeah. But, I mean, there's the classic Andy Reid of ever, taking all the responsibility in the world. It's never a player's fault, whatever. But then there's also just being honest. Like, if Alec Bohm is able to go to the media and be like, yep, I said I freaking hate this place. Sorry. You know, he's able to own it than anybody ever and then be, you know, really appreciated after that, that I think anybody should just be able to be honest. And what I liked about Rob Thompson the other day, when Alec Bohm had that mess up at third base um, in uh, it was the early goings of their most recent series before the Marlins, um, who did they get blown out by 13 to one? I can't even remember now. Oh, uh, yeah. I would whoever... so much shit in the way. Hold on. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. So I, I can't even remember th- four games ago, but when Alec Bohm made that mistake in the first, in the early goings of the game, yeah, it was the first inning. And didn't tag the lead runner or at least throw it a first to get the first out of the inning and they ended up scoring a couple of runs later in the inning. Rob Thompson said that he basically just said after the game, well, Alec Bohm, I think he didn't really know what was going on at the time. If he thought he thought he had more time, he did it. He probably should have fired to first. Hey, look, he acknowledged he should have made a better play. I still think the better play was to wait there, tag the lead runner. But the fact that he at least acknowledged the player made the mistake and didn't say, well, no, I like Bohm being aggressive, trying to turn two there. Like, no, that would have been stupid. So I, yeah. I appreciate that he was honest. And I think most of his press conference, I think most of his answers are very honest. And um, even before he demoted Corey Knable from, uh, you know, the closers role to now just a bullpen arm, he came out the night before and in that press conference said something similar. Like, I can't, uh, you know, I, I don't know if there's something wrong with Corey, um, but we got to do what's best for the ball club, basically. And he kind of lets you know that the a change was coming. Yeah, no, I think he is doing a good job. That was also the Diamondbacks. I went back and looked Thank at you. the Diamondbacks. Yeah, the God. Diamondbacks that we have before uh, this series, who are surprisingly adequate this year, this far. Um, not a good team, but surprisingly adequate this right. year, this far. Um, but no, I, I think he's really is bringing the right message. And I think message, Joe Girardi, Gabe brought too positive of a message. Okay. Now, now in uh, San Francisco, he's from watching because I just like watching press conferences in general. So I watched most of hockey and most of baseballs just to see what guys, how managers speak. Well, Gabe definitely has matured in tenfold since being with him. He talks a lot more like a manager now and not he just has like a scotch now, doesn't he? Doesn't Mr. he have the scotch? He does sometimes have the yeah. scotch or whiskey with the little, yeah, little yeah. bourbon. He's very, he's very chill out there. And like I said, he would, he, I always said he would work better out west because he's from out west. And it turns out he's working a lot better out West because San Francisco is much better than they freaking should be. If you look at that roster on paper, the last two years. Uh, so, but um, I think that's, what's going to happen with Rob. Like Rob seems to be getting the most out of some guys right away too. Like Moniac, I think he sent back down with this talk of, look, your hitting is not in line with the big leagues right now. You have to do X, Y, and Z. And he probably sat down with the hitting coaches. And then in two or three weeks, if you do X, Y, and Z, we're going to give you another run at it. Cause you're this probably, at least even with Maddie or maybe the best fielder of all the options you have in center field. So that, that plays into who you want to play in center field too. When your two guys in the corners are not the sexiest fielder. So I think that's why the Phillies sent him down more. Like I feel, I still feel like Odubel's the odd man out if Mickey Moniak and Veerling both start going because mm-hmm. Odubel isn't a fielder. So like you yeah. have too many guys that can't field well enough that can hit fine. But if like, say Moniac hits 245 and Veerling can hit the 262 at that point, I feel like the Phillies might just kind of wipe their hands and say, whatever we can get for Odubo Herrera, let's just do it because he can't field compared to these two guys. And we need a fielder to get to the gaps with these two guys in the corner. 
Uh, yeah, a thousand. But now I'm, I'm with you there. I, I think you need that defense in center field as fast as humanly possible. I just thought it was interesting that you have a guy, like I said earlier, Nick Castellanos, who struggled, but he's definitely been a champion for a lot of the younger guys on the team. And I remember uh, after he had that uh, check swing RBI double the other day, I think it was against the Diamondbacks as well. He's on the post game uh, interview and he's talking about how you got to be able to trust the young guys. Dave Dombrowski trusted me to come along, gave me two years to play and figure out how you make it in the big leagues and all that. And he was kind of alluding to the fact that Rob Thompson was allowing the guys to do that. And then the next thing you know, Mickey Moniak's back in the minor leagues. So I think, well, that doesn't really match up. <laughs> but it, it seems like right now, look, Odubel Herrera is hitting what, 270, a little over 270 right yeah, now? He's hitting fine right yeah, now. Yeah, he's, he's hitting fine. But when you have the corner outfitters that you have right now, I think you need somebody in center field that can cover a lot of ground. And I think Moniak can get a beat on the ball faster than Odubel can, certainly faster than Beerling can. Um, I think Adam Hazley not working out uh, like he was supposed to at the beginning of last year uh, really set the Phillies back even further than they already were in the center field spot. I would love the Phillies if they're going to make any type of move to get a move to get somebody in center field that can cover a lot of ground. Uh, and right now, I think that position is something that at least the hitting version of Odubel Herrera is at least making up for that right now. And certainly when Matt Feeling gets time out there, I think the hitting version of him has helped this ball club out as well. Yeah. And I also think if I had to give the fielding nod, just because he's quicker at this point with his uh, strides, I would have to give that to Beerling. Over yes. Yeah. Yeah, as would I. Um, but when we now uh, with the Phillies, I think the last thing we would do uh, before we go into a, like a 10 or five minute talk on the flyers and torch a little bit is, what we think the Nationals, my goal coming in is, I would say, because I know Bailey Fulter's pitching one game, so that game I'm considering a wash. <laughs> so we have five games. Three out of five, I think, is a realistic expectation. And then if we take more than that, because I don't want to go and go, oh, yeah, we should take four out of five and then being pissed off when we go. <laughs> so, like, I think going in realistic, like three out of five probability-wise makes sense. And then whatever you get more – is just bonus. I feel like mm -hmm. that's the right way to look at it, but I don't know what your take would be on that. Yeah, I, I think you're you got to win at least three games in this. You win this series. That's the bottom line. You got to yeah. win this series against the Nationals again. Like like we started out when he asked me about this team, well, whether or not this is their level now. Well, if their level is just beating the teams they're far better than, yeah, go out there and prove that you're far better than those bad teams. I talk about this a lot in football with the Eagles when you get a team like the Lions on your schedule. Those are prove it games. Prove it that, that you're not on that level. If you're struggling at the same time, I don't want to hear anything after the game, even if you win 50 to 10. I don't want to hear, oh, well, it was the Lions. No, this was a get right game for you with an easy opponent. You needed to prove that you were 40 points better than them. Go prove in this series that you are at least four games out of five better than, or at least three games out of five, excuse me, better than the Washington Nationals. Show me that you're far and above better than them. Show me that you can win four games. Hell, sweep the series. Bottom line is win it. Go ahead and show off and win four. Go ahead and get bragging rights for a while that you've won five because that would be something. So I think that this series coming up, you have to at least win it, and then you maybe can take a, step, a couple of steps beyond that and maybe go for four, maybe go for a complete sweep. I think realistically speaking, again, you mentioned Bailey Falter. Bailey Falter, you mentioned you know the, the guys are going to be starting in this series here. It's going to be the bats hopefully making up for what you're not going to have in the rotation. The fact that you also have the double header tomorrow in this game, Friday, you have the double header here. So that's going to be tough, but the bats in this lineup should be good enough. And I think what this lineup has done is shown that they can be deep enough to survive that double header. Uh, and bottom line is the Washington nationals are a terrible baseball team right now. So go out there and prove that you're that much better than them. And if Rob Thompson is going to issue a statement uh, before this eight game run, uh, we were playing the three games uh, against the Marlins and then five games against the Nationals for eight games total in the division. If he's going to go out there and make the statement that you got to beat teams in this division, you already won that series against the Marlins. Now at the very least, go win this series against the Nationals. I think the Phillies are kind of uh, in that mode right now. And I don't know if they felt the same thing that I felt yesterday, but watching that game against the Marlins made me feel like I was watching playoff baseball again because I knew how much just winning a series – with the monkey on their back that has been the Marlins, just winning a series against the Marlins meant to this ball club, meant to the fan base, certainly meant to me. Now go out there and do the same thing against the Nationals. If they're playing at that level, I don't think the Nationals are going to be ready for that. Yeah, I agree with that. I love the comeback fight, which we haven't seen from this team as much in the past couple of years that they showed in this series. Uh, Veerling had the key steal also in game one, obviously, which was huge. I think tonight they have to win because you have Wheeler against a heftily struggling 
Patrick yeah. Corbin that keeps yeah. leaving the ball over the middle of the plate. And you have got – that's just the game Castellanos should really have the ability to get going in. And then Veerling should continue to be going because he's facing a lefty that leaves the ball right over the middle <laughs> of the plate. So I think tonight should be a game – assuming the weather's fine in D.C., which I think it's supposed to be now, uh, that I think the Phillies would be good. So I think three out of five is a realistic expectation. But then if we get four, if we get five, then I'm just even happier. But I like now, I used to go in with things with unrealistic expectations to get pissed off all the time when I was younger. So now I try to go <laughs> in with it with the realistic expectation and then just get happier if other things happen. Like, so that's the old Ben Franklin move. You know, always be a pessimist so you're never disappointed. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Where – um like the same thing comes to the team we're going to get to next. John Tortorella seems like he's going to be the coach of the Philadelphia Flyers. Do I think John Tortorella being the coach of the Philadelphia Flyers is just going to magically wow the Philadelphia Flyers into the postseason next year? Absolutely not. So, but if it happens, then I'll be very happy. So I'm going to go into next year going, my goals are much better neutral zone play, much better just structural hockey play. Like the team, kind of like the Phillies, they did not play – the game fundamentally like you were taught to play the game and you're just sitting there watching every other team in the NHL, including the freaking Coyotes, going, okay, this is how you're supposed to play hockey. Why the hell don't we do that? So, right. like, I feel like getting towards in is going to be perfect for that, but the problem is I don't think we have – there's a few guys on this roster that I don't think mesh with what John – like, they're not good defensively. John Tura likes having guys that are – very good in both ends, unless if you're that good offensively, then he's not going to give a crap. So, like, say if Frost and Tippett, for example, because they have experience internationally, do continue to have great chemistry, if one gets good defensively, which would probably be Owen, and the other is just better offensively and produces at least 55 points in Morgan, then I don't think he's going to care. But if Morgan has 35 points and is not the best, then, then that's when Tortorella is going to be like, okay, you need to pick it the hell up on defense. So it all depends what they kind of shape into, but it's a fun hire for sure. It's a hire. I don't know if I agree with from the sense of, I love John Tortorella. And I always said, if I was a player, I would like the blessed I watch, I would run through seven brick walls for a coach like that. But with the direction this team seems to be in, it's more, you might just be staying in this limbo mediocrity period where John Tortorella is just going to make you a better version of mediocrity, basically, rather than a good team. That's the only thing yeah. that I worry a little bit with the flyers at this point. Yeah, I think the Torella hiring is fun because it's a guarantee. You are guaranteed something here with John Tortorella. You're guaranteed that you're either going to get that coach that everyone loves to see kick players in the butts and get all rowdy on the bench and yell at officials and show every ounce of emotion that you're going to have as a Flyers fan. You're going to see that emotion on the bench with the bench boss, John Tortorella, or you're going to see this crash and burn beautifully, and we will all be yeah. here for the fireworks. Uh, so I think that's the guarantee that comes along with it. And as Flyers fans, that's what we want. We we want at least that guarantee that we're going to see somebody that gives as much of a damn as we do. Um, and we could see the guy that actually, you see that rage, you see that fire, you see that passion, bear positive fruit. You know guys are going to be held accountable when John Tortorella is your coach. And one of the things that I heard behind the scenes when it comes to Elaine Vino towards the end of his tenure with the Flyers you kind of had an idea that uh, he didn't really, he had kind of, he knew his voice was done in that dressing room. He knew he wasn't being heard the same way. He knew it wasn't being listened to the same way. So he kind of checked out during his last, uh, last uh, few days as a flyer, last few weeks as a flyers head coach, John Tortorella, go ahead. I double dog dare you to ignore his message. Like I, that's not, that guy is not going to just all of a sudden, yeah, up you're going to get quit. benched. You're going to get benched. Yeah. You're going to, you're going to, something's going to happen in practice and yeah. man, let's just hope the cameras are rolling when it does. Well, Scotty, I don't know if you saw, if you ever check out Cote's the nasty knuckles. Oh, of course. Okay. I just had the guys on the show today. Of course, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll have to check that one out. Yeah. Scott, um, Scotty, uh, Scotty Hartnell. Yeah. Yeah. Scotty Hartnell was on recently. He was talking about torts and he said he got on him about defense uh, for the first like 20 something games of the season about being out of position, then went back and looked at the tape and, the, and in practice was like, Oh, I have to apologize. You actually were in position. And I can't remember exactly what he said, but he's like, I just don't really trust you. And, like, <laughs> and literally like just said to an NHL player that had a pretty good first 20 game start. I just don't trust you. And it's like, so like, like obviously when you have that as a player, 
you have no idea what to do with that. You're like, well, I just gonna have to keep doing well and hope he eventually decides that I'm worth trusting. But yeah, like, watch the right tape, right? Yeah, exactly. Where, um, but like, yeah, Tortorella definitely is funny. You're definitely gonna get interesting press tidbits from uh, John Tortorella. But I think a couple people, if I had to pick guys, I think he's gonna be great for it. Fairby is a very t- like I feel like Fairby has the leadership qualities of in the future being at least an assistant captain, where. And he also has done that in the junior. So I feel like he has the ability to do that. And he seems to be one of those guys that last year, even as a youngster, kind of already admitted and would talk openly about how kind of off the team was because he knew he was still doing his thing. So he could be a guy that talks openly. That's why the one guy that for nitty gritty, Jamie Baskell, kind of compared him to Gagne. I feel like that's not a terrible comparison because Simone Gagne um, is a guy – that stayed good in any situation. And in the crap hole situation we were in this year, Joel Fairby still did good. So I feel yeah. like that kind of works. I think he would do well. I think Sanheim, I know some people were worried about Sanheim when we had Torch. I think that's the opposite for me. I'm more worried about Provy with Torch. Sanheim, I think, honestly, will work well because he has – he's had his best defensive play this year. If we were going by past years of Travis Sanheim, sure, I would worry about him with Torch. But if you're going by – this year and the fact that it seems like they kind of let him play his game he wanted to play all along and didn't try to pigeonhole him if i don't think torch ever tries to pigeonhole anybody so if he continues to do that i don't think i have problems with sandheim the guy i think he might have the biggest issue with the defense is Provy because if Provy continues to talk in press conferences blaming other people rather than himself for things that were clearly his fault that's the first level as pierre luke dubois that's the first level for john twitterella to piss him the hell off so <laughs> Like, you probably want to stop doing that. And he mm-hmm. he would be the biggest concern for me, where TK is a concern more from the personality budding because they're both hard-headed screamers. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's either they're going to do really well together if TK stays on the team and fly, or it's just going to be this, like, three stooges yelling match the entire time. <laughs> and yeah. that, like, so that's why, either way, like you said, that's going to be fun to watch because it's either going to work out great or you're just going to see Travis Konechny and John Tortorella almost like pimp slapping each other every single night because they, just, <laughs> they disagree with like, that's what yeah that's what i need yeah see that's what i'm talking that's what that's what we need right there uh one of the things nasty was telling me uh on the show uh this morning uh thursday morning it was uh <laughs> i absolutely loved was when Vinny lecavier was playing for the tampa bay lightning that year in 2004 when they beat the flyers and that great keith primo team and all that stuff that was insane um Vinny LeCavier was talking about the uh, the bleep you matches between him and uh, uh, John Tortorella, and that's what nasty Derek Settlemeyer of the Nasty Knuckles podcast was yeah. was telling me how they just went at it, man, and it was it was anger with respect if that kind of is a thing. And I was thinking about that, like who's going to be that guy to throw it back at John Tortorella, and who's going to be that guy that will also be like the Dan Boyle of that team? Because if you remember, Dan Boyle was the leader of that Lightning team. Who will be that guy? That will be the more veteran presence in this locker room to kind of go back and forth with John Tortorella. Who will be that guy on this team? Because I think Tortorella, from all accounts, has um, dialed it back. Granted, his dialing it back is still 90 miles per hour. Yeah. Like he's <laughs> dialing it back from 110 going to 90. All right. But who will be that guy that will be able to take that criticism on the chin, defend his fellow teammates? Uh, who will be that guy to step up and the only guy I think of, because he is not a kid anymore, we think of him as a kid, but the guy will most likely be the cat, next captain of the Philadelphia Flyers, and that's Sean Couturier. Yeah. Uh, will he be able to be that vocal, be that vocal of a leader with John Tortorella? As and also uh, healthy boss? enough to be the sure. anchor man that John Tortorella, because with the way Tortorella coaches a team, he's probably going to want to put the juice out there for 25 or more yeah. a night, but he's going to have right. to have the back to be out there for 25 to more a night. So it's, yeah, that's sure. going to be interesting to – follow along too. I, I I think the guy other than tour uh, other than uh Coots that Torch will love as we're wrapping up because we're at like the six minute mark of the Zoom thing <laughs> here, but is fair because I think him and Joel, <laughs> Joel just seems to have that young, very matured where the young players Torch seems to like the most are the ones that act like they're like 32 already yet they're <laughs> so, See, I think like, he'll like Lawton. I think he'll love Scott. Oh Lawton. yeah, I think he'll love yeah. Scott Lawton because he's amazing yeah. defensively. That's also why the Flyers are rumored for Monahan. And I know I've talked with Jamie about this a bit. That makes even more sense now with John Tortorella because Sean Monaghan's offense has been struggling recently, but Sean Monaghan's best asset is face-offs and defense. So for John Tortorella's second center, 
usually he's like, oh, well, I have Tor- or I have Vittoria who can kind of do everything. Just get me right. someone that's good at face offs or defense. And then if they get 45 to 55 points, fantastic. So, like, I feel like he kind of fits into place more where Hayes is going to be interesting because Hayes, his play style doesn't not fit Tortorella, but I think his current skating speed does not fit Cordarello, so he's going to have to get back if he can, if we can see from his injuries if he can get back to his old uh, like stride level and all that because I think mm-hmm. that's what worries me where that's why we might look for a two C and then we're paying a three C what seven million dollars so that's gonna yeah it's gonna affect what you're able to do with other moves but that's kind of the way I look at it I, I'm excited because either way it's going to be fun to see but I it's an interesting hire for me from the perspective of I feel like I was in the boat of the best bet for this team to make Stanley Cups in the decently near future is kind of rebuilding and then hoping to kind of build it back up because you don't have the best. Like, this isn't like the Phillies. You're not looking at the Flyers going, oh, we have the a uh, Bryce Harper. We have a JT Real Muto. We have a Nick right. Like, you're looking at them going, we have four to five guys that we can kind of build around, and then there's every other piece of the puzzle. So that that's not a team you're coming in next season going, cool, we're making the postseason. Like, mm-hmm. that's a team you're coming in next season going, if we make the postseason, I don't know how the hell we did that. John Tortorella better win the damn jackass. So, like, <laughs> that's pretty much the way you would be looking at that. Yeah. Yeah. His third. Get him his third Jack Adams trophy right now. Yeah, that's what no. the Flyers are. Here's, what I, here's another guarantee. I guarantee the Flyers will have more than 61 points next year. That's what I guarantee. Oh, that, yeah, that I definitely <laughs> guarantee. At least at least they'll get to the uh, 65 to 70 point threat. Okay, go oh, up goody. Little, go up a little <laughs> bit. Yeah. yeah right. But, uh, Mark, I really do thank you for joining. I hope to have you on sometime again soon. We could do some Sixer stuff, uh, of course, maybe sure. after the drafts. It would be cool to do reactions to uh, who the guys pick for the Sixers and Flyers and if we're both pissed off or if we're both happy about if it. If they do so, even make a pick, there are you know, a lot of rumors out there that they're going to make a trade, so we'll see what happens. That's a good point, too. And then, well, then we could react to who they traded and if we're pissed off with the fact that they traded a pick <laughs> for that person or if we're very happy that they traded a pick for that person and took the gamble. So there's always going to be something fun to talk about no matter which direction the team decides to go but uh everybody check out the farzy show for sure on youtube you got to check him out if you haven't already he does great stuff he had nasty knuckles on i had a uh, travi on their producer the other day he's funny. oh nice yeah, yeah Trav, great Trav, guy yeah yeah Trav's a great guy he's funny as hell but uh please continue to subscribe down below here at sports and ag news as well also if you're into music uh subscribe to our music podcast all genre music fest stay safe out there everybody and enjoy the off season if you're into hockey. And if you're also a baseball fan, I know everybody doesn't cross over. Enjoy the ride that the Phillies are on right now. Peace out, everybody, and stay safe.